My name is Chanel Trinidad. I have been attending this church for 23 years now. Yes, so basically since I was born. Correction pala, di pala since I was in my mom's womb. Two months after, nung napanganak ako. So anyways, alright. I am currently a part of two life groups led by Ate Karen and then the other one is by Ate Venice. And I'm co-leading one as well for the youth. I am also serving right now in the kids ministry as a teacher, mainly for the 10 to 12 class. Serving our church in the smallest ways that I can is simply an overflow of what God has given to me in our developing relationship. And so I encourage everyone to see deep, deep into the heart of what God is calling you, either as part of a life group or as serving in a ministry. If you want to be part of a life group or a ministry, you may reach out to anyone and surely you'll be connected to the right people. Now may I ask everyone to please stand up as we read the scripture. We'll be reading from Romans chapter 15, verse 14 to 21. It's in page 553. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Let's pray for Kuya Matt. Lord, um, we're just grateful, Lord, that you are here with us today, that you have gathered your people. We are so grateful, Lord, that we are able to worship you and praise you, O Lord. We pray, Lord, that your presence may overpower this place right now. May your Holy Spirit, Lord, be present in our hearts and in our minds. And may you open our hearts, Lord, prepare our hearts, Lord, to accept your word. We pray, Lord, for Kuya Matt, as he speaks your word. May you put the truth in him, wisdom, Lord, and may the Holy Spirit just speak through him, O oh God. Prepare his heart, Lord, to speak your truth, what you want him to say, what your will is, O oh God. And may us, Lord, the people, Lord, be ever so accepting of it. May you soften our heart as we hear it. Continue, Lord, to guide Kuya Matt. Speak as he shares, Lord, what he has prepared. May you just use him as your instrument, Lord, as your vessel to let us know what you want us to know, to teach us what you want, us to, what you want to teach us, O God. May you not let any distractions, O God, um, avoid him or prevent him from saying our word. May you protect him, secure him in this, um, in this place, O God, as he powerfully uses the Holy Spirit, O God, to touch our hearts, our lives, O God. May your word be the truth, accepted, Lord, in this place, and may we um, be, welcome you, O God, into our hearts. This we ask, Lord, through Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Chanel. You may now take your seats. Good morning. So before I get into the word, just want to again, um, I know you've been seeing me, but I just want to introduce myself properly. I'm Matt, and I'm one of your campus missionaries here. And I serve alongside with four other campus missionaries, so I want to uh, mention them to all of you. Arenjo, one of our campus missionaries. Our joy, our joy, and uh, Pao, one of the people who sang here, and of course, E.G. at the back. So there are um, our, our other campus missionaries. And also, 
Um, I'm married to Judy. Judy, where's Judy? Is she at the back? Ayo, there. So Judy, and I'm a father to Augustine and Anselm. So not not the church fathers. Uh, just a fan of church history, but Augustine and Anselm. And uh, <laughs> so so there. So I wanna also before I get into the word, since minsan lang naman po ako magpreach, I wanna take this time to honor our elders here in our church. Um, I, I cannot overemphasize how blessed, as in for me as a, not just a missionary but as a as a Christian, how I'm being led by good and godly men. I mean, I, I kid you not, that gives me confidence. As a missionary, that gives me confidence to be in the mission field. Because I know I have people who got my back. I have elders who got my back. So, so again, elders, thank you so much. Pastor Rafi, Elder June, and all others, thank you. And uh, also, since since nga, means alam mag preach, let me give to you an update about our campus ministry, our missions update here. Um, as of this today, as of today, we already did six major outreaches and a weekly outreach this year. And these evangelistic efforts have already reached out to more than 500 teachers. Yes. So I'm not exaggerating the numbers. These are the really numbers. We've, we've reached out. There's one week. I don't know if you're, you're part of that. There was a week that we ministered to four campuses. That's over like 300 teachers in one week. And then with those efforts, we're already ministered to 200 students as well. So we are currently reaching out to five campuses. And as of today, just yesterday, I found out there are five other campuses that have been added to us. So all in all, um, our campus ministry is being represented by 10 campuses already. So praise God for that. Um, Last week, Pastor Rafi gave you a picture of what our center looks like, weekdays and Saturdays. In fact, if you visit us here on a lunch lunch time, probably around Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, with all due respect to our youth, you would know and you would smell. Okay. No, because they all came from campuses. They all came from straight to the school here. So I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that I love it, honestly. Like, of course, it's being disinfected on a, on a Sunday, but on a weekday, I'm happy, really, because you get to see students. The story that Pastor Rafi said about Jojo being kicked out of his room, that's just, that's just a snapshot of what might happen. No, just kidding. So, <laughs> but just one of the pictures that, that's happening here every week. And um, I want to give another detail to that picture by saying that currently, so we said 500, 200, and all those things. But really, the numbers that really matter to us are the students who are being connected and discipled. So as of today, there are around 90 to 100 students who are going through Starting Point. <laughs> Praise God for that. So Starting Point, that's our own material where we talk about the truth of God's Word, the Gospel. And week in, week out, we're meeting around, yeah, that's, a, that's the average, 90 to 100 students sharing the gospel to them. And, and so um, these are people, these are students who, are, who knew us by weekly hangouts, basketball, and many more. From these students, a handful of students, uh, from this number, a handful of students have already expressed their desire to publicly declare Jesus as their Lord and Savior through the waters of baptism. Um, yes, just last week, we've been receiving stories left and right. People, 15 year old, <clears throat> telling us, that they want to honor the Lord through water baptism. And you may say, oh, maybe they're, not, they're too young to understand that. They don't know what they're saying. I beg to disagree. They know. When you ask them what makes Jesus different from others, and they will tell you because he's the only one who rose from the dead. Amen. They know the gospel, and they know what they're saying, and they know what they believe in. And again, on behalf of our elders, campus missionaries, and admin team, we want to say thank you for all your prayers and support. Every time we go to the mission field, every time you pray for us, you remember us. For those of you here who are supporting a campus missionary who gave in to the mission, thank you so much. You are an expression of God's grace to the field. And so um, your giving goes uh, a long way. So praise God for that. Now, to put this preaching into perspective, I want to jump off from what Pastor Rafi mentioned last Sunday. So this is not Nehemiah, this is Romans, but there are themes that are quite similar. In Nehemiah, um, Nehemiah was rallying the people to join him in the mission of building the wall. Romans had a similar theme, wherein Paul was trying to unite two groups of, different, uh, two groups of people, the Gentiles and the Jews. So the background of Romans is that for, for, for quite some time, the, the church in Rome grew, but uh, a certain emperor, Claudius, ev- you know, evicted the, the Jews. So around five to ten years, they were not in Rome. So the Gentiles occupied their place. But when the Jews came back, 
Okay, bumalik sila. Now it's a different church. Now Paul wrote this letter to unite these people. And interestingly, interestingly, when he was uniting the church, he was not he was not preaching programs or processes. He went back to the simple truth of the gospel. Amen. Because what unites us is greater than what divides us. Amen. Now last week, Pastor Rafi mentioned in his slide, now, all of us are called into mission, but some are called in full time. So today I want to focus on that small phrase. All of us are called into mission. So as I talk about that, join me in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts. God, remind us that the mission is for everyone. It's not just for a select few. Thank you, Lord. We honor you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I was preparing for this preaching, um, I I recall a time when I was in college, not not too long ago. Okay, second year college. I need to say it. Not too long ago. (laughs) So I was in college, second year. So I took up AB Communication Arts. And one thing that you have to understand about this course is in our campus, there's an understanding about this course, why people take this course. So, <laughs> yeah, so um, people like me who take this course, okay, we take this course because we don't like math. Okay? And all of the people across that room understand that. Like, why, why did you take home arts? Ah, kasi ayoko ng math. Okay? So, so that's, that's the reason, okay? For, I would say, 90 to 100 percent, that's our reason. And one, one morning, our teacher for math subject came in. So, alam din niya, hindi siya galing sa, sa, sa college namin. He was from uh, engineering, I think. And then he came in, and then he goes, he greets us. Hey, good morning. And then, all, he, I think he felt like all of us were, like, you know, scared. Like, we were, like, quiet. And then he goes, I'll speak in Tagalog, chill lang kayo. Alam ko ba't kayo nag-com arts? <laughs> and then he said, and then don't worry, I'll make, I, don't, I won't make it hard for you. And uh, so, true enough, he didn't make it hard for us. Diba? Praise God, I graduated. Diba? It's a, it's a, math was my minor subject, but you have to understand, even though it's a minor subject, it's essential to your graduation. Okay, now, why did I share that? I share that because sometimes the way we think about Christianity is a course. And evangelism is a minor subject. It's not for everyone. We think we go high on grace, on mercy, justice. We love expository preaching. But when it comes to preaching the gospel, we say, Matt, that's not for me. It's a minor subject. Now, I said that because I want all of us to to realize this. Evangelism may not be essential to your salvation, but it is instrumental to your sanctification. You're not saved by the number of people you preach the gospel to. But preaching the gospel changes you. Just like what Paul said in Philippians 1, verses 12 to 2, while he was in prison, he said this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of our brothers, of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You see the picture? Paul preached the gospel. He got imprisoned. The imperial guards are asking, why is this guy here? Why is this guy here? And then the brothers now suddenly have the confidence to preach because they saw Paul's example. That's what happens to us. Evangelism is not essential to salvation, but it's instrumental to our sanctification. Again, Matt, that's only for serious Christians. I'm just coasting here. Church, don't forget, preaching the gospel to the lost is so serious. It is a serious matter to God that He sent His own Son to fulfill it. So what's the problem, Matt? Are you mad? No, I'm not mad. I'm just passionate. Okay. (laughs) The problem is this. We do not understand the gospel well enough. The lack of love for the lost and the lack of eagerness to preach the gospel to the lost comes from a shallow and incomplete understanding of the gospel. In simple terms, our lack of commitment to God's mission comes from a lack of understanding of the gospel. It's because we don't understand the gospel deep enough. So what does it look like to engage in the gospel mission? So our text this morning, like what I've said in Romans, okay, uh, Paul wrote that to a church that was filled with two groups of people, Gentiles and Jews. So they were, it's not clear there because Paul didn't plant the church personally. 
but he was eyeing for the church to be the base, to be mission base uh, for the part of Spain. So before he rallied the group of people, he needs to unite the people in the gospel. So he was not merely casting a vision. He was telling them, hey, you share the gospel together. So your differences are actually settled by this truth. And the thesis of Paul, okay, the thesis of Paul for Romans is found in Romans 1, 16 to 17. The, in a way, the, the theme of the whole letter is found in Romans 1, 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, Paul explained to the church in Rome that the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. And it cannot be earned, but it can only be received by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, this is what makes our Christian faith different from others. While others preach good works, while others preach spirituality, we preach Christ crucified. This is the same gospel that gives us the boldness and the confidence to preach it to others. Now, the gospel is not the entry point, not merely an entry point to the Christian life, but the main point of Christian life. It's not like when you meet a person who doesn't know Christ, you preach the gospel and that person works his way to sanctification. No. The gospel is from start to finish. It's from start to finish. So in our text today, In the context, after Paul dedicating a large chunk of exposing the gospel, of explaining the gospel, we go to chapter 15. (laughs) That's so long, okay? So we go to chapter 15. Paul now addresses the people and gives them a a personal address, like like a personal uh, note. He says there in verse 14, I myself am satisfied about you. Now, while I was studying this, I was like, of course you'll say that. <laughs> of course, Paul, you say that. You need these people. You need them. But kidding aside, I know, I know Paul knows them. But my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all the knowledge and able to instruct one another. So he was encouraging them, exhorting them. But despite that, he said in the next following verses, but on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder. So he was encouraging them, hey, you're doing good well, uh, you're instructing one another, but on some points, meaning I made an emphasis, okay, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. Now, what does that mean? After writing chapters 1 to 14 and now 15, what does that mean? It means that it's possible to become a church with sound theology, warm community, but cold in mission. Let me repeat that. It's possible to be a church who is passionate about theology, who have sound theology, who have warm community, but we're cold with, the ch- with mission. And the gap lies in our understanding of the gospel. Remember that Paul was convincing them to rally behind him as he started his mission efforts in Spain. So the question that I want to answer this morning, what does it look like for us to engage in the gospel mission? From the text that we've read today, I want to share with you four aspects of gospel mission. First one, verse 20, and thus I make it my ambition. Here we see the first aspect, ownership of the mission. In other translation, it says aspiration. Paul was so consumed by the gospel that he had been captivated by it. Paul's aspiration and ambition was to preach the gospel. Paul saw the act of preaching the gospel not as a personal, responsib- as a personal responsibility, not as a personal preference. Kung Tagalog, in Tagalog, kung gusto mo lang, he didn't see that. Paul saw that, preach, that the preaching of the gospel to the lost is not a task to be delegated to a few, but a responsibility given by God to all believers. Now, prior to this kind of life, Paul had a different ambition. You know that. His ambition was to persecute Christians. Right? That's why Jesus Christ appeared to him, used him, and Jesus said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. That's what he said, right? What a calling. <laughs> Now, after an encounter with Jesus, Paul was never the same again. Paul was still a man on a mission after his encounter with Jesus. Only now, he took a different kind of mission already. He still have passion, eagerness, but his mission was already different. In verse 15, but on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister. That became his mission of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Now, 
Here we learn that what caused Paul to own the mission was the understanding or the truth that the gospel is a message of grace given to him by God. It begins there. When you think about the gospel as not earned, not worked for, but freely given to you, it changes you. It changes you. It changes your perspective. It changes your destination. It changes your preferences. It changes your taste. It changes everything about you. It is not a responsibility that was given to him by men or earned because he was good. Do you know that Paul was well-schooled? But, but he was not saved because of his knowledge. Here we see that if anyone wants to truly own the gospel mission, the gospel must first own him. You won't own the gospel if the gospel doesn't own you. You won't own the gospel if the gospel doesn't own you. It means that your life's ambition must never be like that of the world. I don't know, but maybe most of us, or some of us here, when we think about our dreams, our aspirations, ambitions, we say, on a Sunday, we, we worship the Lord, we talk about the gospel, we love expository, expository, uh, expository, expository preaching. <laughs> but when we evaluate our ambition, it's nothing like... It's nothing like the, the gospel vision. It's far. In fact, if we look at our ambition, honestly, it more resembles the world. Ownership. Ownership. Do we own it? question for us is this. In what ways have you truly been owned by the gospel? In what ways? In the mission of Christ to save the lost. Because only those who have been owned by His saving grace are able to share His saving grace. If you're truly owned by the saving grace of God, you won't, you won't stop at nothing to share it to others. Does the gospel shape your ambitions and aspirations in life? Does the gospel shape the way you build your relationship? Does the gospel shape the way you raise up your children? For the single people here, does the gospel shape the way you view romantic relationships? Or are you being shaped by the consumerism? For the students, but does the gospel shape the way you study? Or are you just studying for yourself? C.T. Studd, after hearing D.L. Moody, C.T. Studd got saved, and then he got, um, basically, he sort of backslidden, and then he heard the preaching of D.L. Moody. After his faith got rekindled, he joined, jo uh, he joined Hudson Taylor, to do missionary work in China. You know, if for some of you here, you know Hudson Taylor. They, there are the missionaries to China. They, work, they dress like the Chinese. They set up a shop. All for the sake of preaching the gospel. Now, city stud. This is what he said. Someone to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of come hell. On, come on, there you go. Wow. Within a yard of hell. Our ambition is to go to the darkest places to preach the gospel but it's because it is only in the darkest places that the light of the gospel shines the brightest. Amen. Amen. We love this place. It's well lit, right? Yes. Yes. But when you enter the homes of the students, when you enter the community, it's dark. Not just literally, but spiritually. In fact, it's so dark. When we do, when we do starting point with students, they're not holding highlighters. <laughs> They're, hold, they're holding vape. <laughs> they're holding other things. And all the more, I like the response of one of our elders, as we should. As we should. One of the students even told our campus, one of our campus missionaries, sabi niya to, gusto niya magpapaptize. And then this is what he said, Kuya Pao, I'm ready. And buo na yung loob ko na magpapaptize. Kuya Pao, I have experienced a new life na binigay sa akin ni Lord. And I want to publicly confess and declare that my life belongs to Christ. He is my Lord, my King, and the Master of my life. Kahit I'm being persecuted at inaasar ako ng friends ko, I want to become a Christian. Sure na po ako dito. Talk about ownership. Church, are you owned by the gospel? Or are you owned by something else? Here, in the next part of the verse, the next aspect is found in the same verse. It says there, to preach the gospel. So it is my ambition to preach the gospel. Here we see the second aspect of God's mission. Objective of the mission. 
So what is the objective of the mission? It's to preach the gospel. Verse 18, same chapter, said, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. Now, Paul is known to be a man on the mission, or on a mission, and a man of focus. If you ask him what is the one message that he would gladly live for, it's none other than the message of the gospel. And if you ask him what he would do for the rest of his life, it would be to preach the gospel, either by word or deed. That is through his lips and through his lifestyle. Question for us, church, when someone looks at our lifestyle, whose gospel do we reflect? The false gospel or the true gospel? He said it in other letters as well. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Philippians 1, 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. The main objective of Paul's life was to glorify God by preaching the gospel to himself and to others. Maybe that's the reason why we don't preach the gospel to others so much. Because we haven't, been, we haven't preaching the gospel to ourselves so well. Now, all throughout Paul's letters, you would see a consistent commitment to preach the gospel to the lost. It was the main objective of his missionary journeys. Sadly, it's not true to a lot of churches and Christian organizations today. There are a lot of churches today who have been consumed with building wealth, raising leaders, not that it's wrong, creating content, becoming a safe space, and all other things. Not that it's wrong, but it should never replace God's objective for the church, and that is to preach the gospel to the lost. What makes us a church it's not because we're a safe space. It's not because we have leaders. What makes us the church is the gospel. Amen. That's what makes us the church. Yeah. One of the schemes of the enemy is to redefine the meaning of the words that we use today. Have you noticed that? Yeah. They redefine male, female, marriage. They want to redefine family. People, not, people could not even objectively define these things anymore. Sadly, it's the same with the word church. Same with the word church. Where the church is being redefined as a, mere, as a mere care group, a spiritual organization for the needy, a religious organization, we forget that the gospel that we bear is what sets us apart from the world. And because this message sets us apart from the world, our main objective is also different from the world. Church, I plead with you, look at our own lives. Who do we reflect? Who do we reflect? Do we reflect the world or the Lord? We are a community that upholds the gospel clarity and embodies the gospel culture. You know, as of today, our campus missionaries has ongoing partnership with five campuses, one academic institution, and they reach out to more than 1,000 students in a year's time, more than a year's time. Uh, more than 1,000 students and more than 1,000 teachers since last year. And all of those efforts, in all humility, I would say that our goal was to preach the gospel. Yes, it was to serve the community. Yes, it was to build relationship. Yes, it was to provide air support for our campus missionaries. But all these efforts are meant to preach the gospel. We have weekly basketball games. We prep this place up. We have weekly hangouts. We serve coffee. We buy stuff. We make programs all for the goal of preaching the gospel to them. We partner with youth organizations, not for the name, not so, not so we can build our own name, but so that we can glorify one name alone. Yeah. Our facility turns into a hangout in a study place for students because we want them to hear the gospel one day. Emil Brunner, a Swiss Reformed theologian, said, the church exists by mission, just as a fire exists by burning. Nice. Many churches today have ceased to become churches simply because they neglected the mission of God to preach the gospel to the lost. Probably some of you here, or most of you here, 
na burn out ka because you have been used too much. Whenever, whenever Pastor Rafi, whenever we would say, no, we preach the gospel to the lost, we want to grow, you're allergic to that because you have seen what it does to you. Not all growth is bad. Some, God-given, some growth are God-given and it's a blessing and we should embrace that. Now, what hinders us, maybe for some of us, what hinders us to preaching the gospel is not fear, but lack of knowledge and fluency of the gospel. Now, let me quickly share to you the gospel in five points. So, I know we've been talking about gospel-centered preaching, gospel-centered uh, teaching, and, 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 and gospel-centered church. But Matt, what is the gospel? When, them, when someone asks you, can you fluently explain the gospel? Or can you just, will you just say, oh, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you? Yeah, that's true, but that's not enough. So our leadership team here, with, together with one of our elders, Elder Nate, we tried to um, not define the gospel, but communicate the gospel in such a way that it's clear. So the, the message of the gospel contains the truth, that this is, okay, this is the gospel. God, our creator, ruler, take a picture, go ahead. God, our creator, ruler, and father created Adam and Eve perfectly to reflect his honor and glory. But Adam and Eve broke God's rule, rebelled against him, and brought guilt, shame, and fear into themselves and the whole mankind. So God, in his love, grace, and mercy, sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us as our substitute, mediator, and liberator. After rising from the dead and ascending to heaven, he now graciously offered honor, relationship, and fellowship to those who repent and believe in him. Those who continue to follow Jesus Christ will experience eternal life, spiritual honor, and God's holy presence. So whenever someone asks you, when you're in the office, when you're in the campus, what makes Christianity different? Feel free to read this one. In fact, feel free to memorize it. This gospel message is what separates us from Roman Catholics, Buddhists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Hindus, and all other religions of the world. With all due respect, when someone tells you, when someone asks you and finds out you're a Christian, and that person is not a Christian, and then that person tells you, oh, we, we worship the same God. No, we don't. I love you, you're a friend, but we don't share the same faith. No, we don't. There's only one Savior, there's only one God, there's only one gospel. It's not disrespect. In fact, it's one of the greatest expressions of love to tell them that there's only one Jesus, one Lord and Savior. Question, is preaching the gospel one of your main pursuits of your life? Main pursuit of your life. I want to tone down a bit. I want to talk to the elderly. When you think of retirement, what's the picture of your retirement? Is your picture an island? Or is the picture being the field, sharing your faith to the next generation? You're a single person. What's your picture of marriage? Is it a missional marriage? Do you want to get married to express the truth of the gospel? Or do you just want to get married for yourself? Is it one of the main pursuits of your life for the businessman in this place? Why did you set up your business? To get rich? Are your future plans filled with so much things of the world that you have forgotten the eternal returns of preaching the gospel? Have we forgotten church that the jewels, the rewards that we get in this life is not really in this life. Yes. It's in the next and we call them souls. Yes. Yes. Now the third aspect is found in the next part of the verse. Not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. So again, our verse, our verse says, it's my ambition to preach, make it my ambition to preach the gospel, 
And then Paul says, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Third aspect of the mission, opportunity for the mission. Now, imagine with me, if you were with Paul, for example, part ka ng mission steam ni Paul during that time, and then you might think, okay, if you're going to plant a church, you must think of a place where there's least resistance so that you can easily advance. Nice. Right? Nice, nice. Since you're doing it for the... For quite some time, you may want to look at, oh, let's look at, not, not, let's not go to Rome. Let's go to somewhere else. Let's build momentum first. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get some more. <laughs> yeah. Let's get some supporters, right? Yeah. <laughs> but not with Paul. Yeah. Not with yeah. Paul. Even though Rome was that time the world's superpower, even though this nation has put many Christians to death and has persecuted Jews, because for Paul... Every opposition is an opportunity to preach the gospel. Church, hard times are always the best times to preach the gospel. Think about that. When Paul was thinking about the missionary base, he was thinking about Rome. Rome? Of all places? A paganistic world? A paganistic nation? Well, if you look at church history, you would see that the Roman roads actually paved way to the preaching of the gospel. Just as Paul saw every opportunity to preach the gospel to ourselves, he most certainly saw every opportunity to preach the gospel to the lost. In fact, again, Romans was a letter that desired to seize the opportunity to preach the gospel in Spain. And if you ask him, how does he know if he should plant a church somewhere? For example, you ask Paul, Paul, which place, which city do we go to? Well, he would say, where's the darkest place? Or, is Christ already named in that place? If the answer is no, then it's a go. If no, it's go. The opposite. (laughs) Now, as a missionary, this truth keeps me in check. Because whenever people would ask me, for example, our elders would ask me, they would ask me, oh Matt, how's our campus missionary? Uh, How's our campus ministry? And then what campus do we go to? And then I would say, no, we're, we're going to look for um, connection, maybe some Christians, and maybe, you know, find, for the, find, find the, mo- the principal who accepts us the most, <laughs> who welcomes us the most, and then we start there. But when you ask Paul, it's different. Paul, where do we go? Which place is the darkest? Which place doesn't know Christ? Which people do not know Jesus Christ? Those are the questions. We acknowledge the value of strategies and modern approaches. It must not become an excuse to hold back from preaching the gospel to the lost. Sometimes I catch myself thinking that the lack of opportunities is what hinders me from preaching the gospel. That's not the truth. The truth is that usually I just have a lot of excuses. We lack the opportunity to preach the gospel because we have a lot of excuses not to preach the gospel. That's the problem. That's the problem. Here in Makati, Makati City, schools have an overwhelming demand for mental health. They have so few, less than 10 mental health practitioners, and there are thousands of students. For them, it's a problem. For them, it's a problem. Teachers are being burnt out. They don't know which system to implement. For them, it's a problem. But for us... It's an opportunity. It's not a problem for us. Yes, we we have our hearts broken when we see students needing of mental health, but they don't have anything or anyone to give them or to support them with. But for us Christians, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. How can you view it this way, Matt? Why do you think that way? Why do we think that way? By reminding ourselves that our Savior used his own death to give me life. He used the greatest enemy of man, death, to showcase the greatest redemption story. Since God has the power to turn things around, church, is there any obstacle that he cannot turn into an opportunity to preach the gospel? God can turn every obstacle in preaching the gospel into an opportunity to preach the gospel. I want to share with you some of the stories here. 
uh, recently one of our um, staff, si Ate Ruby, I don't know if you know, you know her, she, she takes care of, of the stuff behind, okay, the coffee and all those things, she cleans the place. And then one, one morning we receive a sad news that uh, her son got into an accident. Fast forward, we, we went there, E.G. and Jojo went there, and then while they were waiting, because the, the, the son needed an, needed an operation, so the friends went, and then Jojo and E.G. were there, and while they were waiting, guess what, the, guess what they did? They preached the gospel. Nice. <laughs> they preached the gospel outside the hospital while waiting for a friend who's in the hospital. Opportunity. For us, now don't, don't, okay, don't think that you, don't have, you have to be in a hospital to preach the gospel. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is wherever you are, in the dining table, when you look at your calendar, who do you share lunch with? Who do you share your time with? Who do you work with? These are the people who need to hear the gospel. And then one might say, Matt, these are all full time. Jojo, E.G., of course they're going to do that. Uh, yes, <laughs> but don't forget, we do it simply because we're Christians. We do it simply because we're Christians. The question is this, are you a Christian? If yes, then preach Christ. If yes, then preach Christ. Lastly, the fourth aspect of the gospel is found in verse 21. But as it is written, so you see the flow. Paul says, it's my ambition to preach, my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has been known. And then he quotes an Old Testament text. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So we talked about the ownership of the gospel. How much of the gospel owns your life? Or how much of your life is owned by the gospel? The objective of the mission, which is to preach the gospel, the opportunity for the mission. What do you have now? Who, do you, who are you with so that you can preach the gospel? Now, last, we see the optimism for the mission or the confidence of the mission. Where do we get our confidence from? Of course, the quick answer is God. But where specifically? We find it in the place where Paul quoted it. He said, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Our optimism for the mission comes from the sure fulfillment of his promise. Let me repeat that. Our optimism for the mission comes from the sure fulfillment of his promise. What was the promise? That those who have never been told will see. Those who have never been heard, who have never heard will understand. Meaning, those who are truly his will make a decision to follow Christ. In short, this gospel will not fail. In Romans 15, 8 to 9, Paul wrote, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. Paul was citing an event in the Old Testament. He was saying what happened in the patriarchs. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, for his mercy. Now, what do these verses tell us? It tells us that the outcome of the mission of preaching the gospel has already been decided long ago. It has been prophesied already. This verse tells us that our efforts won't fail or our efforts are not futile because it's not ours in the first place. It's not our gospel. It's Jesus Christ's church and His gospel. Our efforts to preach the gospel and advance His kingdom will succeed because God is faithful to fulfill His word. Isaiah 55 verse 11, it says there, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So even before, church, here's the encouragement, even before you go to a lost person and preach the gospel, don't think, don't worry if the gospel will work. It will work. Just because the person didn't receive, accept Christ, doesn't mean the gospel did not work. No. The gospel still worked. Why? Because he knows what he denied. He knows what he denied. 
and therefore it worked. The power of the gospel is not just at work when someone receives it. It's at work. The, God, the power of the gospel is also at work to those who reject it. Remember that. I remember around a month ago, we were in, in Japan. I was with Pastor Rafi and one of our elders, Elder June. And then we were meeting in a, uh, like a cafe with, oh no, not a cafe, a cafeteria or whatever. So I forgot. <laughs> but it was a place, there was a coffee and all that. And then, and then there were two missionaries, married couple, they were asking us, oh, what can we pray for you? We were closing, what can we pray for you? And then Pastor Rafi and I said, oh, just pray for our ministry, family. And then he goes to Elder June, oh, what can we pray for you? Elder June says this. He said, uh, just pray for provision for the church. I'm not, I'm not worried. And then he, I'm not worried, I just you know, pray, pray, pray for the church. Um, and then he adds, he says this, <clears throat> because it's my dream, it's my dream to not tell these guys to slow down because we don't have resources in the church. Amen. When I heard that, <laughs> I wanted to go home <laughs> because I, have, I know that I have an elder who supports the mission. I have an elder, not just one, but the whole elders, supports the mission, who thinks, hey, pray that the Lord would provide for the church so that we don't have to tell these guys to slow down. Hey, we're running out of coffee. Take it easy. Take it easy on the aircon. Take it easy on the lights. Maybe you can use your own. That's the dream, to never tell people to slow down in witnessing because we don't have resources. I share that because that's the confidence of the word. If that's what the human words does to us, how much more is it with the word of God? How much more is it with the promise of God? Now, when I was writing this preaching, I had a little hiccup. Okay? So, so I, patapos na, okay? I'm about to finish, to land, and then a question popped out in my head. Matt, are you sure that's, that's, that's what Paul meant? Regarding the mission. Meaning when he said, it's my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not been known. Are you sure that's what he meant? The aspects of the mission, ownership, objective, opportunity, and optimism. Are you sure? And then it made me pause. It made me almost you know, delete the, the whole manuscript. But then I tried to look. I tried to look. I tried to look for an account. And the Lord led me to Jesus Christ himself. Look for 43. And Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. <laughs> Jesus Christ said it himself. Here you see, I must, the ownership. Jesus owned it. He did not delegate it. He said, I must preach the good news, the objective. He knew why he was here. And then he said to the other towns as well, he saw the opportunity. Yes. He knew where to go. And then he said, I was sent for this purpose. He knew that he was prophesied long ago. And that was his optimism. Yeah. And as I close, you, you know, one of the questions that I want to ask is this. Now, Matt, where's the gospel in all this? Where's the gospel in all this? Church, the gospel is this. You were the former mission field. Think about that. You were, we were the former mission field. We won't appreciate this if we were not saved. Yes. We were the former mission field. But because of the gospel, you are now the bearer of the mission. Yes. The grace that saved us from our sins is the same grace that sends us to sinners. That's right. Before we were hell bound, now we're heaven sent. Let's say it again. Okay. Before we were hell bound, but now we are heaven sent. Church, the gospel has the power to transform the field of mission into the force of the mission. You are the force of the mission. Where you go, the gospel goes. Where you go, Christ is represented. I want to end with this story before we pray. 
So one, one day, I think it was this year, yeah, prayer and fasting. So, of course, we were fasting, so we were slowing down, <laughs> less work, not much students. So we were just, you know, preparing for stuff, preparing for the uh, prayer meeting that night. And then uh, it was one afternoon, two ladies entered our premises. So they went around, okay, they, were, they entered their premises. One was a foreigner, one was a local, a Filipina. And then, so they went inside, started conversation with people. Um, Hi, hello. They were very nice. Okay? And, then, and then Pastor Rafi went out. And then when he went out, they started talking about from, from, oh, this place is nice, to the Bible. So that escalated quickly, you know. And then, and then the people, the, these two uh, ladies, sort of tested Pastor Rafi. Of course, uh, Pastor Rafi. A uh, brilliant pastor. Right? So they, they tested him. Wow. Right? They tested him. How? By testing his Greek, right? What's it Greek? Hebrew. Nice. They tested him. Nice. All right? So they, they exchanged notes, Bible, and then Pastor Rafi was like, you know, sounded like tongues, but no nice. okay. So, <laughs> but, you know, he, he spoke it, word. Like, he really spoke it. I was like, wow. Pastor. And, then, and then they went into a certain passage, and then because of that passage, it was revealed. These guys, the two ladies, are actually Jehovah's Witnesses. And they're trying to evangelize us. What a person to evangelize. Our lead pastor. <laughs> of all people. You know? And so Pastor Rafi sort of, I heard, I heard him, I was talking to the other lady, and I heard him talking about church history quickly, you know, in the best Bible. And I was like, wow. Well, he, he ran down through the church history quickly. And then what... What I got from that experience is this. These people who bear the false gospel, talk about the false Christ, the wrong mission, have so much audacity to enter this place and preach the gospel. Makes me mad, you know why? How much more is it with us? How much more is it with of us who knows Jesus Christ? How much more is it with us who bear the true gospel? Shouldn't we, more, shouldn't we be more bold? Shouldn't we be more courageous? Aren't we the ones who should look for opportunity and preach the gospel? Aren't we the ones who should be shameless in saying that we have Christ as Lord and Savior? These guys enter our premises. I'm not mad at them. Okay. These guys enter our premises and think and believe that they have the right gospel. How much more is it with us? Sometimes we're even surprised. Oh, Christian ka pala. <laughs> church, church, may it be that we bear the gospel and along with it, the boldness and the courage to preach it. Amen? Amen. Join me in prayer. Let's pray. Father, sovereign and in control, thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. God, I pray, let the gospel truth burn in our hearts. Lord, today we repent for the times, for the times, Lord, that we overlook the, an opportunity to preach the gospel. Lord, forgive us for the times that we were ashamed. Instead of being, instead of being ashamed, not being ashamed of the gospel, we quiet down and we silence ourselves. Lord, give us the boldness. Give us the courage. At the same time, give us the consistency. May what we preach be consistent with how we live. Thank you, Lord Jesus.